That said, uh, four dollar specs. That's that's what we we all live live by and use uh, today. Just last month, the 4.1 draft specifications were published, and and you're welcome to read them and and send feedback on it. I will cover 4.0. I won't go 4.1, although that once it has been officially certified, and and that's the new standard. So, one of the nice things is the wide support, both by the industry as well as the research and academic community. So pretty much everybody in this industry supports OpenMP, and that's really a good, good thing, a very, very good thing. It also gives very wide feedback, input, and it definitely increases usage and portability. So that's a good thing. You can get this list from the OpenMP.org website. So when does OpenMP come into, into the picture? Well, in case you're using an automatically parallelizing compiler, it's always worth to try. Depending on your language, your algorithm, the way you type it all in, a compiler can either do magic or not find much. Uh, it tends to be that Fortran, especially the older style Fortran, is easier for a compiler to analyze than C, C++. The higher the level of abstraction, the harder it is for a compiler in general to find the parallelism, but it's worth a try. Figure out for your compiler what option there is to do that, and who knows. But what if the compiler either doesn't find the parallelism, or it finds parallelism at a level that you say, that is not good enough. It just parallelized some initialization loops, and that's it. I need more. So that's a reason to consider opening. And of course, if you're not using any automatically parallelized compiler at all, or you don't like to go there, um, then OpenMP is the natural choice. Be aware that many compilers have options to help you to give warnings and you know, OpenMP is a very harsh model in the sense that you tell it to parallelize something and it will do so because they like that. But what if you made a mistake? What if that part was actually not parallel? So some compilers can issue warnings saying, are you sure you want to do that? So check your documentation to see what your compiler has available. So what are the advantages of OpenMP? It's a standard, again, a de facto but widely endorsed standard. It's mature. One of the things the language community does is they're very careful in adding features. It's, it's all that tamping to just throw in more and more and more have a new spec every year, and then everybody gets confused and nobody's using those features. So there's a lot of discussions, even though like a one clause on a pragma can have endless discussions, which is good. So that's what I like. They don't go for the fashion of the day. Like it took long to get the accelerator support and CCNUMA support. The reason is that it's hard to make it abstract enough to be useful, understandable, and portable. The easy way is just to throw all the low-level stuff at the user. That's not what the OpenMP philosophy is about. So I think that's a, that's a good thing. Another thing is very strong focus on backward compatibility. I'm sure you all have had some experiences where things work today and tomorrow they stop working because somebody said, well, then you should fix your code, change your code. That's what the OpenMP community tries to avoid at all costs. And I think they do a very good job. And it continues to evolve. You know, the 4.1 draft specs are out, the first rumblings about 5.0 have started, so it continues to adapt to user needs. You can definitely get good performance and scalability, but you got to do it right. And the fact that I think the language is easy doesn't actually mean that you can be stupid. If you write a stupid program, you'll get stupid performance. You know? So don't make that mistake. But what I like, when you have the, the, the moment from idea to implementation is usually pretty short. But don't do certain things that I'll talk about. So you're not off the hook, but it, it is definitely um, definitely a scalable model. Portability, I've said that already. Um, as I just said, it's it's the, the effort, the programming effort is fairly modest. But again, you're not off the hook. And another thing that I like when you're totally new to this stuff, you can do it step by step. You just tackle a very small part of your program, and gee, it works. That part is fast. Of course, the overall performance may not benefit from it, but it's very encouraging. It's a very gradual model instead of all or nothing. So don't forget that. Just start slow. 
And eventually you'll probably realize that your initial effort wasn't the right way to get the ultimate scalability, but it gets you going. And that's another thing that I like. As it turned out, OpenMP, although never designed, there were no multi-core systems at that time that was targeting SMPs, but a multi-core is like a, a small scale SMP from the old days. So everything maps very naturally. The memory model, the threading model, it's pretty lightweight, it's not a heavy model. Again, it's mature and widely available in use. So, so much for the, the commercial. Let's go into the deep. The syntax, I try to avoid you know, boring syntax details. This is the only, only thing where I really get a little formal uh, just because I don't want to have the confusion. Uh, in C, C++, uh, the directives are case sensitive. Okay. And the syntax is pragma OMP and then a directive, like parallel or for or task. And optionally, each directive has a bunch of clauses. And those are all documented and I'll cover some of them uh, during this talk. These lines can sometimes be long, so you can use the backslash as a continuation in the pragma. That's, that's the standard way to um, use continuation in a pragma so you can break it over multiple lines. You get the guarantee that the underscore OpenMP macro is set, so you can do an if def on that and make decisions and compile them based on that. In Fortran, you always got the issue of the fixed old style ancient formatting and the free formatting, but um, so it starts with either exclamation mark dollar OMP or C dollar OMP or star dollar OMP. What I like is the first one, exclamation mark dollar OMP, because it works in both formatting in Fortran. Um, when you use a fixed format, don't forget to um, put this in the first column. Of course, it never happened to me, but it could happen to you. And the, the downside of a directive is if you make a typo, that's true in C as well, it gets ignored. And you think, why doesn't this code run in parallel? Well, maybe it was that fatal typo. So. Again, never happened to me, but may happen to you. Okay. How do you define the parallelism in OpenMP? It's really easy. Um, I sometimes when I'm in more challenging mode, I do, do a live demo, but it's just as easy as you identify a block of code, whatever it is, and you embed it through a Pragma OMP parallel, and you see you have these curly braces, that defines your parallelism. In Fortran, you have the OMP parallel, and what I like is the end parallel. There's no end parallel in C, that, that's a syn syntax thing. Uh, as a word of warning, um, and I see a typo on this slide, but um, I like to end that curly brace with some comment. So I know that that's where my parallelism ends, because the C program has a lot of those. And that's probably curly brace you want to be careful with, because it defines where your parallelism ends. And, and so I use some sort of marker um, because it can be quite obscure. But it's as simple as that. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about barriers later uh, and much more in the afternoon, but a parallel region always ends in a barrier. And a barrier is a point in your code where all threads wait until the last one has arrived. So that can have an impact on performance, of course, and I'll talk about that, but there's always an implied barrier at the end of a parallel region, and there's a good reason for doing so. So, the hello world example, couldn't resist. Here's my main program. I have a print statement, and all I need to do is frag my OMP parallel around, curly braces around it, and now I said this will run on as many threads as I like it to be. So you type this in, and you compile, and you gotta check your compiler what option there is to recognize those, those pragmas. Um, I would like them to be automatically recognized, but I don't think any compiler does that. And I'm, um, I'm not a compiler person, but I would say, okay, I typed it in, why didn't you recognize it? But check your compiler documentation, like in DGC, it's dash F open MP. This is from our, our studio of compiler. We use X open and to have those pragmas recognized. Otherwise, nothing will happen. Okay. I got correction from Helen. The Cray compiler does it by default. Okay. That's it. I, I like that. 
Um, again, be careful that typos could you know, silently ignore things. Those are the first gotchas that people run into, like, it doesn't work. Yeah, well, maybe, <laughs> well, why? And think about that option. Okay, assuming you've got that all covered, you set the number of threads, that's the number of initial threads, and in this case, I set it to two. I use the OMP num threads environment variable. So I run that program, and both threads will print a lower. And I want to run on four threads. I set that variable to four, and then there you go. It's literally as easy as that. Okay. One other thing I like about the the OpenMP is that I can I can use the if clause. I can say, and just look at the example here, drag my own parallel if and then whatever condition, as long as it evaluates to true or false. And what it means is if it if it evaluates to true, you'll go parallel. If you evaluate if it evaluates to false, you'll run on one thread. And the, the key use is to say, well, what if my if my, my data set is too small? I don't, I don't want to run in parallel. So I can still have one piece of source, and that's what I'm trying to illustrate here. If the loop length, only if the loop length exceeds some threshold that I define, I will actually execute in parallel. So in that way, you have one source, and it should run efficiently either on small sizes and on larger sizes. Very convenient um, clause, I think. Um, I'm now going to show a much more elaborate example. It's usually good for some discussion. Um, and I call that an airplane flight. An airplane flight is, means it's made up on some long airplane ride, and it has no scientific meaning at all. So don't try to read anything into it, why I would do something like this. What I want to show you is the flow of the computation and how I could parallelize it. So let's say I'll, this is my computation. I initialize a variable f to 1, then I compute a vector z that depends on x and y. I then compute a vector a that depends on b and c. And finally, somewhere, I want to compute a scalar called scale, where it's summing up the elements of a, of z, and f. That's, that's what I'm doing. How would I do that in parallel? There's several ways. I'll show you my recommended way. First of all, we're going to embed this whole block in a parallel region. That's golden rule number one for performance. You'll hear it more throughout the day. Minimize the number of parallel regions. A parallel region is relatively heavy in terms of cost. So we don't want to have too many parallel regions. So what I do, I'm going to define my parallelism from top to bottom. It's a bit like MPI. You know, in MPI, you start off running in parallel. That's, that's what I'm doing here. And Ignore all these details on the, on the pragma for now. This is my parallelism. What that means is that all threads will execute f equals 1. All threads will compute z. All of them will compute a, and all of them will compute k. That's probably not what I want. So I want that fine, then we're done. So what if I want to have this one distributed over threads, and this one distributed over threads, and this should be done by, by one thread only? Maybe. This one being initialized by all threads could be, could be good or bad. What I did, and I haven't talked about the memory model yet, is I declare this f to be private. That's in the clause here. That means that each thread will have a local copy of that variable. Although it's a shared memory system, you still have a reserved corner called private memory and each thread will have its own copy, so they'll all happily initialize f to 1. So all threads will have access to that variable. It happens to be the same value in this case, that's the deal. Then I get to that loop. How do I distribute the work? Well, as is very convenient OMP4 and OMP2 in, in Fortran to parallelize a loop. So what will happen here is these n iterations will be spread over the thread. How that is done, I can fully control, or like here, I leave it up to the system. You figure out what you want to do. But if you don't like the defaults, you can you can you have a lot of choices. And again, that will all be covered. So here we'll go we'll go truly parallel. 
each thread will get a chunk of the iteration state. I use a feature that, that is, is, I would say, advanced but useful. It's called no wait. And it actually does exactly what the word says. Threads won't wait when they're done. Technically, there won't be a barrier at the end of the loop. So what it means is that as soon as a thread is done with whatever work has been carved out for it, it'll continue. And it'll get to the next loop that I want to parallelize the same way. Again, by default, there's a barrier here, so they all wait. Why should they wait? Because this computation, the second computation, is independent of what I've been doing so far. And barriers are expensive. You want to minimize the use, so I use the no way. Now, as I, as I said, no way is not for the beginner, but once you start fine tuning a program, it's a really nice clause you can play with and get better performance. Now, but now I've got to be careful, because if I wouldn't do anything, they'll all start computing scale. Not only that, what's the guarantee that A is available? Because some threads may take longer and they're still working on their computation, while other threads start summing up all the vector elements. I, I hope that problem is clear. I can't see all these other people, but I hope, I hope you all agree that this gave me a wrong answer. So what do I do? Well, there's an OMP barrier. So that forces all threads to wait until the last one has arrived. That means I enforce all these computations to be finished before I continue with them. So that's, that's one way of doing it. A problem with OpenMP, in a way, is often there are multiple ways to implement the parallelism. Usually there's only one that's right for performance, but it works. So again, that's part of the performance um, session this afternoon. So this is, um, this is the way I, I would like to write it. Now about that pragma. I, um, I use the if clause for demonstration purposes. If, if the loop is too short, I don't want to have anything running parallel. So the parallel region will be executed by one thread. Um, I use my favorite clause, default none. What does that mean? That means that I need to specify where variables go. And as I said a while ago, in OpenMP, you have two types of memory, shared and private, and I'll get back to that a little later. But in this case, I, I want to have the arrays accessible, the vectors accessible by all, so I make them shared, and the scalars are private, so each thread will get its own copy. Again, more on that very soon, but that's how, um, how you would do that. So, that was, this is about as complicated as it gets, actually, mostly. Okay, uh, here's one thing, and it's only one slide. It's, um, I never know where to put it, so I just dumped it, dumped it here, and um, it's, uh, it's nested parallelism. Nested parallelism has been an open thing from day one, although not really thought through when they first put it in. But uh, the idea was we need to handle recursive algorithms. So what you do, in the parallel region, you jam another parallel region, and you go parallel again, and again, and again, and again, if you want. It's called nested parallelism. As suggested here initially, that the number of threads explodes pretty quickly. So these days you have more control to specify how many threads you want. And actually, in many cases where nested parallelism is used, tasking is a better solution. And tasking is for after the break. But it's there, and it's, I, I want to mention it. OK, we'll go back a little higher level. What do I get when I, when I start using OpenMP? What's my toolbox? My toolbox consists of the directives. The directives to kind of share the work like the loop I was showing, that's called the work sharing directive. You all the threads share the work and they, they figure out who does what. For work sharing, there's a system called tasking. You get controls over thread affinity. You can master your accelerator. Uh, you can cancel a thread if there's some problem. And you get primitives to do the synchronization. That's what you get at the directive level. At the environment variable level, you can set um, all sorts of things about the threads, like the number of threads. You can control what threads do. For example, if there's no work for them, what do you want with, what do you want to do with idle threads? You can control how you want to have the work schedule, the affinity, the thread affinity. You can say things about acceleration, cancellation, and 
the whole operational thing, for example, the sex app that, I'll, that I will talk about. Runtime functions are very similar to the environment variables. The idea is, is that most things you set with the environment variables can be queried at runtime and changed. You say, well, you know, that was my initial setting, but now I want to change it, and you get runtime functions too. I've already mentioned this a few times, now it's time to, to go into it more detail. The memory model. That's more or less a lifetime topic, but uh, I'll keep it short here because it's not, well, you know, it's not all that much you need to know. What you have, you have a pool of threads, and each thread will see the same shared memory. There's only one shared memory. And, and I, I stress that because when you have a distributed memory background, that, that is like a, a different thing. And I, I noticed over time that questions arise from the misconception about the memory model. So there's one shared memory. And in addition to that, each thread will have a private memory. What's the difference? The difference is that whatever a thread does through private memory, and that's like the, the MDI memory model, nobody else will see. Remember my variable f, I set it to one. Nobody else will know about that. I could set it to any value and there's no interference. All threads get their own call. The difference is the shared memory. In shared memory, there's only one instance of the variable. All threads, we can read and write at any moment in time, and it's up to you basically to make sure that happens at the right time. Read and write variables, and they communicate through the shared memory. If I have a variable that I want to make available to another thread, it has to be in shared memory. Either I copy it from my private memory into the shared memory, or I put it in shared memory from the start. The choice is yours. So that's that's how the how the memory model works. And again, if a thread modifies the value in shared memory, after a while, everybody else will see. And now on purpose, I said after a while, because I have to talk about that as well, when these changes are visible. So that's a new thing when you're new to this kind of programming, is that for each and every variable, you need to label the data. You need to, you need to think about all your variables should that variable be shared or should it be private? And that's part of the learning curve. Now, OpenMP has default rules for that. I consider them to be broken. I don't understand them and they're too lengthy. So don't ask me about the default rules. Think about it yourself. It's really good practice to do that yourself. First of all, you want to you wanna minimize the use of shared data for performance. Very convenient to have, but don't excessively share data if you can avoid it. And it's just good practice to think about it uh, yourself and say, okay, this, this variable should be shared and this one should be private. And especially after you've seen some examples, you give it a try, um, you'll find it's not that hard. And the reward is, is tremendous. If you want to rely on the default rules, call your lawyer, don't call me. Um, because again, I, I think they're very, very subtle. That's probably the politically correct word to say it. But um, that's why I use, and I kind of jumped over that on purpose, the default none clause. The default none forces me to compile a flag any variable that I didn't specify. Now, if that's too much for you, there's other ways around it. I'll, I'll point that out. But again, I've seen too many people being bitten by those subtleties. That's as easy as shown here. How do you do that? Private and a list of variables and shared and a list of variables and there you go. Shared is pretty straightforward. Uh, private is a little more tricky because it's like a different variable inside the parallel region because each set will have its own copy. Of it. There's actually no connection with the original private variable outside of the parallel region. It is like a different variable. which. Find that that's actually what you want. As a result, private variables are undefined on entry and exit. So you have to either give them a value or use the first private clause that I'll talk about. But keep that in mind. These are some important rules for private variables. And um, that's what I just said. That's a big one. Private variables are undefined on entry and exit. 
And if that's not what you want, you can use the first private to pre-initialize private variables, and the last private is to save variable out of a bell loop. So you have a way out. It's just not the default. And it's, there's very little need, actually, for, for these things. So again, very simple. First private, you put in a list of variables, and all these variables for each thread will be initialized to the value they had outside of the parallel region. So variable A had a value of 10. I declare first private A, all threads will get a pre-initialized value of 10. Could be very useful. So it's not that you don't need to do something complicated, just think about first private. Last private is, is a little more special. Think about the word last. Last has no meaning in a parallel program because the order is not defined. So it depends on the construct. Each construct has a well-defined interpretation of last private. A loop is easy because that corresponds to the last iteration executed. That's the value that you get out of it. With some other constructs, it's defined, but you have to think about what does last mean here. I kind of crafted a little example on the first private. I'll do that fairly quickly. Um, what I want to do is I want to pass in a variable called index, INDX. INDX is used as some sort of offset in an array. And what I want to do is each variable should have an initial value of that index of four for whatever reason. And from there, it starts indexing into my vector. This is a private variable. Again, each, each set will have its own value. The fact that after the initial launch, index will be different depending on the thread idea is okay because they all have their own call. So that's how you play and use private variables to get to your goal. And first private can come in really handy. Again, most often you don't need it, but if you need it, it's convenient. convenient. Last private, uh, the simple case is the loop. To preserve the sequential semantics, the last private value of A is the one that corresponds to the loop iteration I equals N minus 1. It's what your sequential program would do. So we preserve that. Mind there's a small cost with that. Nothing's for free. The, the runtime system will have to handle it. So use it with care, but if you, if you need it, it's very convenient. Okay, there we go. The default, I already mentioned default none. You can also say default shared. I wouldn't recommend doing that. Because again, for performance, excessively sharing data is not a good idea. So default shared, it wouldn't be mine. Again, the, 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 the scoping of the variables isn't that hard. In Fortran, you have some more choices. I guess the language rules why there's no default private in, in C, C++. Um, that's not, there's not a typo on this slide. It's not available. And um, again, I use default none. And you choose whatever you like to stick with. Now, I talked a lot about private data. Now it's time to talk about shared data. And absolutely, this, this is a big part of the learning curve. You've got to get this right. If you get it wrong, you'll get wrong answers. OpenMP is pretty ruthless in that sense. You want to have a private variable, we'll give you a private variable. It's up to you to make the right choice. Um, shared, shared is a little kind of special because, because of the way computer, computers work these days. A lot of asynchronous updates going on in the system. So what the specifications allow is that the same shared variable can have different values for a while. And it's very well defined when that value should be resynchronized so all threads see the same value again. And that's enforced by a thing called flush, and it's implied on many constraints. So I don't want I don't want to certainly not at 10:15 in the morning, I don't want to make people very worried about it, but it is something I have to point out. And the best way to point it out is with an example. Here's a, 
a fairly advanced way of parallel programming, I think. What I'm setting up, I have two threads, and one thread, thread A, is in, in charge of a shared variable called X, and it's shared. And what I want is the other thread, or threads, will wait for that variable to change. It's like a flag. Changes, I want to do something. Now, here's the problem. This program setting X to zero, and at a certain point, it'll change to one. So what I want is this one to trigger on that. So you've got these compilers. And compilers like to optimize your program as much as they can. And that means that they like to keep variables in registers. Register changes are not seen by other threads. So if this program is fairly well optimized, that change is in a register, not in a cache, yet. And this thread will, may never see that change, and it will hang. That's been a notorious problem in shared memory programming from day one. This is not new to OpenMP. What OpenMP is, has done is formalize the solution to this problem, which is a good thing. Before that, you need to have hacks like in C, you would declare variables volatile, so the compiler would load and store the variable all the time to make sure it gets the right answer. That's overkill. That, that costs you a lot of performance. So think about this a kind of special scenario. And here's, a, here's one from the example set that I mentioned a while ago, the ones you can download. That's, that's by far the most complicated example where I have a thread waiting for something to finish. It's actually waiting for an I.O. operation to be completed. And what it does in a while loop, it will read an array element execution state I, and it will wait for that to change. So if it's not read finished, it will just loop there and the sleep kind of display. So it'll, it'll wait there. Now this is exactly the problem that I just pointed out with my variable X. Some thread will change this value, presumably. How does the other thread know? That's the same problem, and with OpenMP you get the flush to actually flush the variables back into the memory hierarchy, and all changes are visible to all threads. And that's called the temporary view. While it's different, and after that you globalize the variable, they all have the same value again. So by forcing the flush, I know that I'll get the most accurate, most recent value of that value. Again, this is a little sophisticated. You don't need that unless you do special things, but I thought this is a natural moment for it to show up. I do need the flush here. For those of you interested in this kind of program, I need it here because the next time I'll read, I need to make sure that I read the right one. I do it initially, but I have to do it more than initially. And actually, the one writing this variable needs to do the flush as well to write it back into the memory here. So you need it on both sides. Again, flush is not for the faint of heart, but it's very, very useful in those cases. So you need it. You get rid of all sort of uncertainties about compilers optimizing. So it, I, I really like it. But again, not for the faint of heart. And um, there are some other things you probably want to read up on. So check the specifications if you want to use the flush. The one thing that um, I think we discourage is you can selectively specify variables. And that gets really tricky. And I actually, in the book, I put an example how tricky that can be. Don't, don't use the list. Do a global flush of all the variables or don't use it at all. Once you start playing with individual variables, you really have to know a lot about how compilers behave and what the rules are. So try to stay away from it. I think at a certain point we didn't consider to uh, remove it, but you know, that will break a code and we don't want to do that and so forth, but we can. Okay. What about the memory already? As I promised in my introduction, we'll go deep even in the introduction. We'll go higher level again until we um, before the third. So how does a program, an open and program execute? There's always one thread running. You start your program, there's always one thread running from start to finish, and that's called the master always run. You start and when you monitor your program with top or the monitor tool, you'll see that, that running. At a certain point, when it hits the parallel region, the other threads are engaged. 
That's when you go parallel. And the hello world is a simple example of it. At the end of the parallel region, they wait. There's an implied barrier, implied synchronization. The master set will continue. And until you had hit the next parallel region. That's called the fourth join model, and that's how an OpenMP program executes. That begs the question, what do you do while there's no work for these other threads? And that's under control of an environment variable called OMP weight policy. It can be passive or active. Basically, what that means is when it's passive, it will release the hardware back to the system saying, I don't need it for a while, you use it for something else. That's a very social friendly approach. The active approach is, I'll just keep it. Nobody else gets it, I got no work for it, I'll keep it. And um, you get the choice. And the system has a certain default. In general, I think this level of control is just not enough. When you go this way, you probably want to have some finer control. I think most compilers give you that, but that's a non portable, specific environment variable to that compiler. Like we have one, and I like to I like to use it. But if you want to stay fully standard compliant, use OMP weight policy, passive or active, and you hope the implementation does the right thing that you expect it. Okay. So something that I've mentioned a couple of times already, um, and, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, is the barrier. Um, I already said what it is, but why do you need it? Well, here's an example. I have two loops. Loop number one computes A, and loop number two computes B using A. If I would run this in parallel without doing anything special, my claim is one day I'll get a wrong answer. And again, I promised not to ask questions to the audience, but the question is why? Well, there's an applied assumption here. Assumption is that A of I is available whenever the thread executing the second loop needs it. Well, think parallel. You know, that's, that's the hard part about parallel computing. What guarantee do I have? I don't. The thread that's supposed to update A of I may have not done so yet. So I'll, I'll need the stale value instead of the new value. That's actually called the data risk when when you have a, a disconnect between reading and writing shared variables. I'll, I'll say more about data races later, but it's called, it's an example of a data race. Okay. So what you really want is all of A should be computed before I move on to the next one. Now the simple solution would be to fuse these two loops into one, then you have that guarantee. There's other ways. But if you can't or don't want to do that, you can put in a barrier to enforce completion of all the work here before moving on to the next one. And that's why every parallel loop in OpenMP has a barrier. And that's why I like the no way, because very often you don't need it. So as part of the fine tuning, you put in your pragmas, you get the right result, and then you start looking for opportunities to use the no way to eliminate the barrier. I don't think compilers have gotten to do that for you yet. And you, you take control and use the no way. Okay, that's the barrier. But the behavior, behavior is like this. A thread gets into the barrier region, starts waiting. At that point, it's known how many threads should enter that barrier region, and it, they all start waiting. So they wait, they'll wait until the next one arrives and they continue. And on purpose, I made this slide so that you see this is a great opportunity for wasting cycles. Um, it's called load balance problem. Threads don't finish at the same time, so barriers are the ones you want to use with care. And again, there are ways around it, but it certainly gets you the right result. Oh, and, and the barrier is one example that has an implied flux. So with the barrier, all shared variables are synchronized. Not actually and the syntax is really easy pragma OMP barrier, uh, OEM Fortran OMP barrier. 
when do you when do you want to use them? Well, again, it is it is absolutely needed in some places, and think about the no way, but uh, you better know what you do. And in a way, I already said a lot about it. Um, because of syntax issues, you, you put it at the, at the top of the loop, for example, and a port at the end. That's a more logical place, but you can't do that in C because of syntax. So I think this. Yeah, this, this, was, um, this was part of the um, elevator ride, a long one, I know. And um, we'll have a break now. Uh, we'll have a, we have a 15 minute break. 15 minute break. We'll be back 10:47.